Okay, hello to Raymond and Marta. I will adjust this. Um, hope everybody is well at your house and you get test results soon. I think that the first thing, I asked you to write a brief opinion piece, we will call it, on the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers. And if you would give that to me, do not feel... Just be cool. Okay be cool with had, it. Like, uh... I'm just so used to giving backstories. Is it okay? Like, oh, not yeah. backstories, but like, you know. Explain what the heck's going on. Okay. Yes. Yeah, no, that's perfectly acceptable. If you didn't do that, that's fine. Okay. Marta will be proud. <laughs> I, put a I put two quotes in line. Marta will be very proud. Awesome. I put two quotes. Oh my gosh. Did you put it? Everything is like. Do you have a video for me back? I think I got it over here. Like this jewel or something. Uh, okay. Okay. I have not beat anyone yet. Um, okay, and so Raymond and Marta, you can send me yours. Email me yours. Um, again, I think great changes need to happen in the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers teaching. I even thought about just Xing them out. And, but you want to get rid of Emma. I don't. Don't know what's wrong with you. Um, you're the one who spoke. You're like the target audience. For Jane Austen novels, I, mm. I'm sorry. I'm in love with Jane Austen. Thank you, Meredith. I love. You. Okay. No. I just heard about. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting. Hopefully, we can we can make it interesting. Oh. So you also read the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. It is long. It is. It's a little weird. It's maybe more than a little weird. Um, do you understand now if someone were to come up and say this job is like an albatross hanging around my neck? You're all looking at me like I'm insane. People, okay, people do say this. Helena's like, no, people <laughs> never ever say that. Um, yeah. Is the albatross like the bird? It is actually physically the bird. Okay, yeah. They I hung the like, dead what, what bird the, around the, his the, neck. The, 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 what do you call it? The, the rescuers? Like Albert the Albatross? Oh, like yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love the rescuers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's what I think of. Oh. I actually saw that in a movie theater when it first came out. Wow. That's how old I am. I'm sorry. What <laughs> you want to say, Adriana? Have you ever heard anyone actually say the thing? What, about albatrosses? Oh, yeah. It's a thing. I'm going to, like, it's when a thing. I die, I'm going to be like, did I ever hear something? <laughs> 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 You're on the lookout now. Yeah, we're gonna be like, okay. Some like 40 years from now, I'm gonna get a phone call from one of you. It's like Mrs. Ferguson. I finally heard it today. I'll be, I'll be deaf and seen. I'm like, what? Who is this? How did you get this number? We'll send you a cookie with it. No. Interestingly, though, if if you had to sum up a a moral, what is the moral of the rhyme of the ancient mariner? Don't kill birds, is that what you said? Okay, that is one. Don't hang a dead bird around someone's Yeah, I was thinking of something a little broader than that. Don't kill anything? Oh, thank you. Okay, yes. Do you remember at the end, towards the end, he, he has, and this is also one of the Mrs. Ferguson's famous quotes that you've never heard of before. <laughs> um, <coughs> he, he prayeth best who loveth best all creatures great and small. Okay, you've heard all creatures great and small. I know you have because James, the James Harriet novels, okay? Um, and it also, there is another rhyme that that's taken from because the, um, what is the four? All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all, okay? But as far as I know, Coleridge is the originator of the all creatures great and small phrase. I could be wrong. Maybe the, the the four lines came before. I don't think Coleridge was a big copier, though. I mean, he... Um, but remember the romantic poets? They're super into nature, right? A celebration of nature. So like, you don't, if you kill animals wantonly, like, you will be doomed, and all your companions will die, and you will barely make it home, and... Oh. <laughs> so I mean, don't do just, it. That's just a lovely, lovely oh. poem. It is, it's... It gets mentioned more than you would think. Um, it always makes me think of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. 
And it makes me, the vision I have now, indelibly, of the, of the happenings of the Rime of the Ancient Mariner are when they sail into that dark island. Oh, Do you yeah. know what I mean? I always feel like that's where the Mariner's. I'm always picturing, you know, his companions crying out in fear. And, but it sounds more from the poem, like they're just dying of starvation, and aren't they? I mean, basically, of thirst and starvation. All his companions end up dying. He's the only one left. And they're all laying dead. Right? I'm, I'm looking for affirmation. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a hard copy. And if I, if I, if I do anything here on my computer, I'll... Oh, wait, for the... Yes. Oh, it's right. There's a... Sorry, I wasn't... That was... That's okay. Um... It happened before that. Oh, okay. Um, okay, the spell was snapped. Be okay. They're all dead before that. Oh, yeah, and this is where the voices talk to him. Is this the man? Is it he, quoth one, is this the man? By him who died on cross, with his cruel bow, he laid full low the harmless albatross. The spirit who bideth by himself in the land of mist and snow, he loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow. God loves the animals. Is this a Christian value, like love of animals? If Yes, why, and if no, why not? Yes, I feel like we're just called to love everybody and everything. Okay. And why would animals be qualify as in everything or everyone, do you well, think? Because they're made by God. Okay, they're God's creation. Um, also, I'm thinking um, in the Old Testament, uh, the Israelites were told not to muzzle the ox when it is treading out the grain. In other words, so you have this ox and it's, pulling the millstone that grinds the separates the wheat from the chaff let it eat let it let it go ahead and eat too it deserves to eat um also it says the righteous man cares for the life of his beast so um i know what, what do you think of people and this is not to judge any of you but like people that have pets but they treat them like human beings that's you know what you know what I mean, don't you? That's a little extreme. I mean, pets are not human beings. Mm -hmm. They're not even close. They're a great comfort. They're wonderful, but they're not human beings. They're why? Human why do you think it's so easy to fall into that trap? This has nothing to do with our lesson today, but I'm curious. Because they're so cute. Because they're, <laughs> they are really cute. People are lonely sometimes. And people are lonely. Yeah. They do have personality. They do fill a void. I mean, I, I believe they make people. They say that if you have a pet, you live longer. Like older older people with a I pet. I believe that. Um, partly emotionally and maybe partly because you got to get up to take care of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't. Okay, what What have I done? So what's the purpose? Come back. Oh, do you, do you need it? I need, I need it because I found him. I found the place. Okay. Um, you just tap on the screen. Yeah, one after one, by the star dogged moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turned his face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his eye. Four times fifty living men, and I heard nor sigh nor groan. With heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they dropped down one by one. The souls did from their bodies fly, they fled to bliss or woe. And every soul it passed me by like the whiz of my crossbow. It sounds like they just dropped down dead, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Suddenly? That seems a little harsh for the killing of a bird. <laughs> Thank you. That's why you don't kill birds. That's why you don't kill birds. <laughs> Our next poem is another one of these romantic poets. And maybe that makes you feel, yay, or maybe like, oh, great. But two poems, very short. Okay, are we good? Yeah. This is your reward for slogging through the rhyme of the ancient mirror. 
Um, he is Lord Byron. He's known as George Gordon Lord Byron. It's one of those things. You know how when people get a, a lordship or some title of nobility, they get a different name? It makes Shakespeare plays sometimes very difficult to read because they call them sometimes by their noble name and sometimes by their actual name, and you're not sure who this person is. So he's Lord Byron, or he's sometimes George Gordon Lord Byron. Um, he was a good friend of Percy Shelley, who was also one of the Romantic poets. You are going to get to know Percy Shelley's wife fairly well because his wife is Mary Shelley author of Frankenstein. Okay, so, and we will hear more about Byron and the Shelleys hanging out together because the story of the writing of Frankenstein has to do with them hanging out together in Switzerland. But uh, Byron, okay, so the early Romantic poets were not doing so bad to celebrate nature and say, we're not machines. The younger Romantic poets rose up and they tended to be very anti-God, anti-church, to live extremely immoral lives. I don't know why. Maybe the lesson is if we celebrate nature apart from the creator, it goes bad. I don't know. It's just something to think about. You know that, think about the sun worshipers and moon worshipers you know the sun is beautiful and the moon is really beautiful and the sea is beautiful and the rivers and the trees but if you separate them from the fact that god created them they come to bad uses and so unfortunately i can't report very good things about byron and shelley's personal lives and habits we'll talk more about that with shelley but they were lovely writers and so i have given you a couple of Byron poems. Uh, these both, you know, we've looked at celebrating nature and celebrating the individual, right? This is going to be celebrating the individual because presumably the ancient mariner gave you all you want of celebrating nature, perhaps, for a while. Again, I encourage you to read them out loud. Maybe one of these will be the one that will be the one you just think you want to memorize and recite to everyone. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, I was expecting Catherine Young. And I just noticed she's not here. Sorry, Catherine. Um, presuming you'll be watching this too. Um, Catherine's grandfather passed away. Um, he had the virus. So they are... Um, She's not coming to class on Thursday because the visitation is on Thursday. So she was going to try to come, but apparently she didn't get it right. All right. Now we get to talk about A Tale of Two Cities. Yay. Yay. Okay. The first thing I want to do, this isn't very professional looking, but I took a bunch of notes on the French Revolution. Um, and I, I just want to go over the <coughs> historical event. So I'd like to point something out. Um, Charles Dickens was not a historian. He's a novelist, okay? And so I'm sure you guys have read some sort of historical fiction already in your lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Some sort of fictional story, but based on, in, 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 in a historical time period or based on historical events. So you know that not necessarily everything that happens in the book when it's historical fiction happened exactly the way it's presented in the book. Are we, we're okay with that. We realize that. Obviously, the French Revolution is a real event. But there's a problem, and a lot of people <clears throat> are irritated with Charles Dickens about something. Um, he read a historian named Carlyle who wrote a history of the French Revolution. Remember, Dickens is writing 80, 70 to 80 years after the event. So it's like us writing about World War II. And um, he read this one historian, and this historian strongly felt that oppression of the poor and oppression of, of the lower class was the reason for the French Revolution. 
And Dickens wrote that, and he sort of got that idea, and he, he, he got this idea for a novel you know, something based on this idea. But now people have studied the, the revolution, and it seems plain that there are a lot of different forces going on. Um, however, I gave you a page last week, I believe, out of the King's Ledger of Expenses. Did anybody find out how much a livre is in 2020 money? Mm -hmm. uh, I completely forgot to try to find this out. Uh, we're going to guess they were spending plenty of money. It was in the millions. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, everything costs more now. Do you, do you know what I mean? Every, mm -hmm. But I will, I will see what I can do if I can find that out. It is without a doubt that the king and the nobility were spending a lot of money on their luxury and personal pleasures. We meet the guy who has to have four people to make his cocoa. Right? Four people. We'll just feed it to them. <laughs> yeah. Um, we meet some pretty nasty and luxuriously living noble characters. Say that again, Thomas. I don't know. I feel like it would just be more of a hassle to have one person like actually feed me cocoa. <laughs> just like put it down and leave me alone. Yeah. But, That's but awesome. Stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're wearing white. Yeah. <laughs> so then now you need four more people. Oh yeah, you need the cleaning crew. I learned that Queen Marie Antoinette was probably one of the most extravagant French queens because she had her own country estate she had a little estate now i was fortunate enough to go to france when i was 18 and we went to versailles now unfortunately the three days i spent in paris was some sort of holiday and versailles was closed thank you so much and so was the louvre oh, are you kidding me the louvre? yes <laughs> i want to go somewhere. i know we didn't get to go in but we got to go to the grounds we did not get to go inside the palace yeah this happened earlier it's from, it sounds like it's the phone, it's from the kitchen, or the... It's a new sound, and it, it, it's new to me, but it troubles me a little bit that it's new to you as well, and you live here. Tina, your house is haunted. Um, <laughs> oh, well, you can tell him he's missed two so far. <laughs> Um, Versailles. Uh, so we got to go around the grounds, and it was stunning. And yes, apparently it became an, a fashionable thing to try to... Okay, remember, this is the romantic poetry period, celebration of nature, and this celebration of shepherds and shepherdesses and living out in the country and a glamorizing of the beautiful life and they just picnic on the on the hillsides and they forget that sheep smell and that shepherding isn't a real lucrative business you're not going to live high you know as a shepherd and anybody who's ever tried to picnic a lot knows then the ants come and then it rains and then it's just and then the flies are buzzing and the wind blows your stuff over and it's not all it seems but <laughs> people thought it was so yes so Marie Antoinette they on the on the grounds of the palace they built her her own shepherdess palace so she could go and pretend to be a shepherdess <laughs> and she had friends and they dressed up yeah. and they just like cavorted in the countryside and they just went on picnics and, and sat on the hills and stuff and pretended to be shepherdesses did they have sheep? I don't know. Honestly, I don't remember. Probably not, because they would make them stink, and they might get them dirty, and there'd be poo. Yeah, it'd be dangerous yeah. for shepherdess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, sheep can sheep. be a little aggressive, too, on occasion. Oh, you know, they can gracious. charge you, like pigs can, too. Okay, Alondra, yes. So, so when you talk about, like, romantic... Like, I know we've talked about the romantic poems a lot, but, like, for me, like... Um, they're, they're romanticizing um, nature and then like the way like being in the countryside so it's just like romanticizing and making it sound like appealing yes uh, but like in the music the romantic composers mm -hmm. well, they were romanticizing the feelings like the okay mm -hmm. so they're not the same. no it is 
both. Okay. So, um, if you notice, I'm glad you brought that up because if you notice in the poems that are a celebration of an individual, like that, um, um, Man, my train is in the ditch. The um, uh, but Lucy's in her grave and owed the difference to me. That one, um, what was it called? Oh, it was um. I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> well, I, I keep wanting to say she walks in beauty, but that's the one I just gave you. Um, uh, she, she a, a a maid whom there were few to know and very she if you were among them. untrodden ways. Okay, yes. <clears throat> it's very emotional, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It evokes, you're sad. You're sad for this guy who has lost a woman who is obviously important to him. You're sad for the tragedy of her, we assume, young death. It sounds young. Um, so, yes, playing on emotion. And the rhyme of the Ancient Mariner plays on our emotion of horror. I mean, we... We're sort of desensitized to, I don't know, scary stories or horror stories or that I'm sort of not. thing. Well, no, <laughs> oh, thank goodness. It's, it's good. But, but you know, just to think about, oh, my gosh, he killed that bird and then they were cursed, like supernaturally cursed, and all his crew members fell down dead on the deck, and it just kind of creepy, you know? Um, but it plays on our fear. Right, and, and a disturbing sort of image and a disturbing emotion. So yes, there is definitely a connection of, of an emotional, um, dredging up the depths of our emotional feeling about nature, about individuals. Okay, because you know, because at first like, you brought up like, oh yeah, the sheep and like being a shepherdess and it's like, but that's not emotion, but yet there, that's the romantic. Yes. It's not, and so this is why it's hard to define the romantic movement because it's all these things at the same time, and it might mean different things to different, um, you know, forms of art, whether it's music or painting or, or, or uh, poetry or literature. Um, but in general, it has those things in common, that vein running through it of evoking emotional responses to nature and individuals and, um, and not necessarily a positive emotional response, but like any emotion was good. Again, because Descartes, we are a spirit inside this machine. We're driving this machine, our body. And they're like, no, we are not just a mind in a machine. We have feelings. And of course, like I said earlier, some of the romantic poets then took it, their feelings, started living by their feelings, which hopefully you're all old enough to know can lead to absolute disaster in life if that's all your only criterion of whether or not I should do something is I enjoy it, I want to, I feel like it. It's not a bad thing, but it's not the sole criterion. But Byron, Shelley, they started making it the sole criterion. Okay, so, yes, Marie Antoinette was cavorting around with her shepherdess ladies. Yeah, um, there was a lot of extravagance, it. but we don't know that there, that was all that was happening. So I have just a couple of pages of notes. This was the results of my reading like three or four different history books, and I just distilled it so we could get a picture of what's going on. This is basically your history lesson on the French Revolution. Um, the P So back to people not being happy with Dickens. They feel like he distorts the view of the French Revolution, but for many of us, me included, my view of the French Revolution is A Tale of Two Cities. For many people, that's as far as it goes. Maybe for all of you, that will be as far as it goes. You will never decide to take some class or dive in depth to the French Revolutionary period, which is fine. But just know that Dickens is also telling a story. He's a novelist, and so that doesn't mean he's going to give you a complete political picture of the French Revolution. Okay. So here's what I wrote down. <clears throat> I'm going to just read this off here because I wrote some st statistics I thought were interesting. In 1789, which you haven't got to in the book yet, but is the year they tore down, broke into the Bastille. And do all of you know what I mean when I say broke into the Bastille? Like literally yeah. broke into it. Yeah, like the storming of the Bastille. Raise your hand if yes, I'm totally, I'm familiar with the storming of the Bastille. Okay. Um, I will, it, it will be good because I will talk about it here. Um, 
but right before the revolution full scale broke out, it says 95% of peasants in France were free. They weren't slaves. They weren't serfs. However, they were still subject to feudal dues. All right. It was like the feudal system was still going. Remember the feudal system, the medieval feudal system? I owe my lord, the lord of the manor, money, produce, service, and they keep me safe, right? They still had to basically rent their land. They had to pay to use the lord's mills to grind their flour. Right? All these, a lot of these things we talked about last year. If you've read any medieval history, you know about this. Um, but here's another problem. So we met, we met a lord. We met the marquis. All right, who ran over a child. Apparently this did happen too. This was not, oh, Dickens totally went overboard on that one. No, they raced in their carriages through the streets and didn't care who got in the way. And poor people got run down and killed. Um, so lords like the Marquis, and so picture his little town, you know, he's got his, he's got his, um, his estate, yes, his stone, stone. <laughs> estate. It's going to have one more stone face. Um, it says, lords were enclosing more and more land. Okay, I'm the marquee. I've got more sheep. I've got more cows, whatever. I enclose more and more land for my animals. That leaves less and less land for all you peasants out there to farm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm claiming more for more and more and more for myself. You get less and less. All right. So these feudal dues said took up about 10% of a peasant's income. Another 8 to 10% went to the church. So you're down 20% and you're not making much. Um, they had state taxes, market taxes, fees for the parish. In all, they think peasants at that point were left with about half. Whatever you made, you got half. Half of it went to other places. Okay. Um, this was an interesting statistic. Statistic: sixty percent of peasants owned less than the thirteen acres needed to support a family. They estimated it took 13 acres to for the animals, for the crops, to support a family, to live off what you made. 60% of the peasants in France at that point had less than that amount of land. So you can see why there might be unrest, right? While the marquis keeps extending his holdings and fencing in more land that you can't have. In 1788, I'm going to skip over some of this. In 1788, apparently there was a terrible drought and then hailstorms that ruined crops. If you only get to keep half of what you have, that's not good. Then the winter following the drought and then the hailstorms was terribly cold. It was 18 below. Oh my goodness gracious. And, okay, no central heating. Probably not um, adequate clothing. And it says there was one monastery that for six weeks fed 1,200 people a day. Basically, that was the, the food pantry. Wow. The local food pantry, monastery, homeless shelter. Were they able to do that? I, I would assume from, first of all, the church had large holdings. I would say. Um, I, I would not think it would be... Uh, Donations or contributions from the wealthy, Grace you know. God, I'm I'm thinking that because at this point the church in France had become quite wealthy. At least in this case, they were doing they were doing something good with it. You know, wealthy church does not necessarily mean evil church. Um, it depends on what you're doing with the resources collected. Do you know what I mean? If you're just a clearinghouse to distribute it to the poor, great. We want you to have plenty of money because you're distributing it. What? That technically wouldn't make you wealthy. Though. No, it wouldn't. And supposedly in a monastery, no individual person would be wealthy. The monastery as a whole could be wealthy, but no individual person would be wealthy then because they've taken a vow not to own anything, one would think. 
Those of you who read Robin Hood with me yeah. remember the rich, <laughs> the rich uh, clergyman, though. Okay, so something had to be done. Um, the other thing that's going on is the the French nobility, like the Marquis, aren't real thrilled with the king. The the king keeps taking more power. The more king the power the more power the king has, the less power people like the Marquis have. So there was some class warfare there, but I'm not going to I'm not going to dig into it. In 1789 in May, they called what we would call a, a like a congress. They called um, the the states general, they called it. And there were three groups of people. <clears throat> the first group is the clergy. They were the first estate. The second estate is the nobility. The third estate is not the poor, but like the middle class. Tradesmen, shop owners, blacksmiths who are doing well, that sort of thing. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the clergy, <clears throat> there's 300-ish of them that attended. There's 285 of the nobility. There's over 600 of the third group. All right, we've got 300, 280, 600. If <clears throat> we, have to, we have two choices if we're going to vote on legislation. Choice number one, each of these three groups gets one vote. Like, like they, the, the clergy all votes among themselves, like the Electoral College, right? And then we cast our vote this week as a group. Second, we cast our vote this week. Or we could have every single individual person vote. Dad. Which way do you think the third group wanted it to go? Oh, yeah, because they will carry it all. Does that make sense to you guys? If, if each of these three groups just gets one vote, there can't be a tie because there's three. And, you know, but... The group of 300 and the group of 285 get the same voice that the group of 600 got. On the other hand, if everyone votes, the 600 group has enough votes to conquer the other two groups no matter what. So they couldn't even agree on how to vote. That's a bad start. That's a bad start to any sort of political meeting when you can't decide how to vote. Um, so um, they kept delaying they couldn't get anything done. And of course, each of these groups had a different desire. The clergy, first of all, we won't tolerate Protestants. Kill the Protestants. They didn't all say kill the Protestants, but it was, you know, it was very anti-Protestant. And um, we don't like these Enlightenment thinkers and all their atheistic ways. We got to put an end to that. That was their agenda. And also don't take away any of our land. It's their agenda. The nobility... The king keeps taking away our powers and we want it back. That's their agenda. But the middle class, the small business owners, it's, they had a big list. I wrote down open career opportunities, confiscation of wealthy church holdings, free education, abolishing all those taxes that take half our money. So everybody's got their own ax to grind and they can't decide how to vote. So they put it off. Now, um, it says the king, feeling his throne depended on the clergy and the nobility, resisted the demands, but made plans to address them all. He sent for workmen to get the meeting hall ready, but he didn't tell the third estate, the lower class who had broken themselves off and become their own assembly. They showed up at the meeting house and it was locked up. It was actually because they were working on getting it ready for everybody. They thought they'd been locked out. They thought they'd just been locked out of the meeting. So they went off, this is where we all are, to a tennis court. And they all met on a tennis court. And they took an oath, and it's called the tennis court oath. <laughs> Isn't that clever? Do you like that? How original. The tennis court oath. And they said it took an oath to band together to establish new conditions in the kingdom. Okay. The king said, you break it up. And they said, no. We won't break it up. All right. But 
these no these these are decent middle class people. They've got property of a, to a certain level, you know, they got their own shops or everything. But they were trying to stir up help. People like the Defarge family. Maybe the Defarge family are a small proprietor. All right? But notice the people that come in and out of their wine shop. We're going to call them the riffraff, for lack of a better term. All the jocks that come in. <laughs> I just thought that was funny that I was like, Jacques? Yes. Jacques? <laughs> Are not. They're sort of the unruly, I've got nothing to lose. Like the poor man whose child died. And he decided to hitch a ride on the Marquis' wagon and do something about it. When mobs get started, we know this very well from recent events, they can get out of hand very, very fast. People do things in mobs that they wouldn't normally do. And this third estate was really working up the mobs so much so that the mobs got out of their control. So on July 14th in 1789, 8,000 people showed up at a prison in Paris called the Bastille. And they broke in, literally. literally, to let the prisoners out. There were only seven prisoners. So 800. 8,000 people oh, 8, to let seven prisoners out. But they also thought there were guns and ammunition in there, and they wanted them. They killed the keeper of the Bastille, uh -oh. and they took the guns. Not so were they guns? Uh, yeah. yeah. As far as I know. And uh, so this, this group of people now became the National Assembly. To heck with the clergy, to heck with the nobility, we're in charge now. We got the numbers. We got the guns. We're in charge. And um, so, but actually it wasn't, it wasn't so bad at the beginning. They, they, um, well, I say it wasn't so bad, comparative to later. They wrote a constitution. We're going to clean things up. We're going to make the clergy swear an oath of allegiance. Um, but, however, we're also going to completely, like, de-church the church. They set, they set up a statue to the goddess Reason. They did this. this got, it got worse as time went on. At the beginning, you know, there were all these thinkers in France, these enlightenment thinkers. Oh, we're so brilliant. We're so smart. We're going to use reason. We're going to just be able to solve all the world's problems. We don't need God. God just keeps us down. This whole church thing, it's just all superstitious hocus pocus bunk. And we're just going to rise above that now. They were making the clergy take an oath to this. Ooh. Of course, many of them didn't. And they had to flee the country or they were in, in danger of their lives. But a lot of them did. So did this happen like, like um, at the start or was this? With, the within the first year. Okay. Within the first year. However, these, um, th this, this initial push, like they were going to, they divided the country into 83 departments. They had a plan. Okay. But it got out of control and mobs in Paris by two years later, because that's the first year, by, by two years later, basically it's mob rule. They even turned on these first revolutionaries and started guillotining them, one after another. I wrote down here, um, they estimated 16,000 people were guillotined in nine months. Some people estimate up to 50,000. We just don't know. Um, so the, the radical, the, the crazy mob party took control. In 1793, they condemned the king to death. They took the king. They took the queen. This is referred to as the reign of terror. Mm -hmm. Basically, it was the deal. You guys know this from other fiction you've read or history. Like It's the idea that if you say anything questionable like if you question the government we will arrest you and kill you it's like the vision we have of a, a communist government or yeah, something say, you will disappear if any of you have read 1984 the novel 
you will disappear if you ask questions. That's what it became. You're going to see this unfold as you read A Tale of Two Cities. Um, so just to this, this national convention, it says they removed the word saint from street names, pillaged the churches, encouraged priests to leave the church and marry. They started a new calendar, which is significant because our calendar counts from Jesus. Like to, to start a new calendar means this is now the life-changing, world-changing event. The revolution is the year one. We're more important than anything that's gone before. Um, they turned uh, Notre Dame Cathedral into the Temple of Reason. And in November of 1793, they held a public ceremony there to worship reason. I can imagine that made pretty, people pretty mad. Is Lady Liberty gone very, like if we all started burning incense to the Statue of Liberty or something? That would be weird. That would be, I think that all haul us off to a loony house if we started doing that. Okay, so. Oh, are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? What, what are we debating? I and missed it. If we started, if we started burning incense, they aren't going to haul us off to a loony jail because of yeah, the freedom they, of religion. What, to the Statue of Liberty? Yeah, oh, no, they'll let us do that. Yeah. Oh, people do weirder things than that, Meredith. <laughs> yeah. That's true. People may laugh at us. We'll probably make But if we're devoted to the statue, we won't care. We'll make national <laughs> news. We might. Oh, by the oh. way, okay, this is now your, your moment of fun for the day before we, and then we're going to dig into the book. Um, so, yes, I get on Facebook occasionally, and um, there's a, a, a Facebook group called Classical Studies Memes for Hellenistic Teens, and it's just, it's funny. And so, a, a Latin teacher had posted that uh, she had told her students, when they took quizzes in her Latin class, if one of them got done early, they could draw pictures on the back, because she said, first of all, it makes the ones still working not feel so bad, you know, that they still have their papers. Second of all, she gets to see crazy pictures. And, but she said two things coincided. One, she, she told them that they could draw pictures, and she also informed them that there was a god of the sewers, like a toilet god in Rome, Clokina, um, wow. the, the, the god, goddess of the sewers, and they actually had, like, ceremonies. So she said now she's getting pictures of people fighting toilet gods and she said she had a student took a video of them and they were around the toilet and they were like propitiating the toilet <laughs> goddess or something like that and she said then they also she taught them the be verb and she said they chant it because they can't sum s est sum s est sunt and she said so in the video they were chanting the be verb conjugation around the toilet like they were summoning the demon and she said sometimes she's walking through the school hallways now and she just hears the chant and she said i'm pretty sure my colleagues think i've started a cult <laughs> that was funny and then yesterday from this same place somebody said that their college roommates were i guess i shouldn't laugh at this but sacrificing animal crackers <laughs> To, to, to a goddess so that their Greek final would be canceled. <laughs> my children, my children once built a Lego altar and Barbie was, <laughs> was the goddess. Okay. Barbie was not, no, there was no human sacrifice. Okay. Wow. The story. The beginning of A Tale of Two Cities is probably one of the most famous beginnings of any book ever. My dad only knows it was the best. Yes. Of have you time. had you heard this before? Yeah, the you, beginning. You, you, oh, have I done this to you before? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm I, I'm I'm going to read the first two paragraphs. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. 
We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face on the throne of England. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. In both countries, it was clearer than crystal to the lords of the state preserve, the lords of the state preserves of loaves and fishes that things in general were settled forever. Right. This book is called A Tale of Two Cities. What two cities are the cities, do you believe? London and Paris. London and Paris. So the title even tells us two things are going to get compared, right? And then we open up the book, and right off the bat, it's this, it's this. It's one way, it's the other way. And this entire, I don't know if you noticed it, the entire first chapter, which is not very long, compares the king, the, the royalty of England, the royalty of France. Things happening in England, things happening in France. Um, why do you think he starts off comparing two things? You've read half the, half the book so far. Like, why? And and have you noticed him doing any other comparison as you've been reading? Um, there was... Uh, there was... Um, the A lot of comparisons with the um, revolution. Um, like... Um, there was, he was comparing, like, what was it, the fountains to, um, like, not being able to, like, there was a dead child, and then there was, there was going to be another, um, there was going to be, like, a, the mob, he compared, like, the mob to an ocean that was going to wash everything away. Yes, he did. And then there was, um... There was um, a wine cask, and he compared it to blood. Yes. I love everywhere. that one. I love that comparison. So Do I was like, why would you start a chapter with a wine cask? <laughs> and then he pulls out the clutch. Mm -hmm. awesome. do, do we see any characters being compared? Or, or like set beside each other? There's one, one is an obvious. There's two characters. Yeah. Mr. Carton. Mr. Sidney Car Carton. Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Let's go with that. So we have Sidney Carton is. What is the relationship between Mr. Striver and Sidney Carton? Works for and it sounds like he does all the work. Does it not sound like he does all the work? Um, so do you remember the scene where they go late at night and they always say that they they hang out and drink, but we find out what really happens. Sidney drinks a fair amount. But then he goes and he puts wet towels on his head to like clear his head. It's like the equivalent of drinking a bunch of black coffee. And he works till three or four in the morning going through all the cases. Like he does all the paperwork and Striver lays on the couch and drinks and, and naps. <laughs> because Striver is the public figure. The carton does all the grunt work. When do we? When is the stellar moment when Carton carries the case? What does he do at Charles Darnay's treason trial? Yeah, and and what what does he? What is the plan? How does he? He does something. He actually gets Charles Darnay acquitted. What does he do? Yes. Okay. Did you understand why does that make the case? Why does the fact that Sidney Carton looks like Charles Darnay make Charles Darnay get acquitted? Because couldn't know if it was him or not. Couldn't know if it was him or not. Reasonable doubt. Like, I swear it was that, that person. I saw that person doing this. Are you sure it was that person? Have you, ever, have you ever seen someone who looked like him? Uh, what about me? 
don't I look like him? And it was enough reasonable doubt to sway the jury. Oh, maybe it wasn't him. Maybe it wasn't him. That would actually work for my mom because every there's lots of people that are like, are you so and so? I was like, no. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, if she's ever on trial, <laughs> Just find which I hope mom. not, if she ever <laughs> is, tell her to bring her lookalike. Um, so, Jerry Cruncher. I love Jerry Cruncher. Every time I read this he's book, like, I love him more. Like when he's describing, he's like, his hair could like rip the pillows. He's like, ribbon. I love, I'm this... like, you're, you're, his wife is a trooper. Okay, with so for so what long. is she doing when she flops? Praying. She's <laughs> praying. Don't go flopping against me. All right, so <laughs> what is, what does Jerry Cruncher do for a living? Okay, he's an errand boy for Telson's errand man, you know. But what does he really do for a living? He digs up dead people and sells them to surgeons. Oh, that's a terrible job. He's a resurrection man, which is what they called people who. Um, I noticed, so we, uh, so I, I got, I got, okay, I got sidetracked because I got so excited. Okay, so we were comparing characters, mm -hmm. and we were comparing Carton and Striver. Okay, so Carton is the, is the grunt and the brain, and Striver is the uh, public figure who's a little more, um, well, no, I was thinking, like, more acceptable, more socially acceptable, more um, adapts himself to what's expected of society yes like yes like back in school apparently they knew each other in school oh even back in school you were like that sydney you need to make something of yourself why don't you if you just tried harder you could make something of yourself like, yeah. excuse me no. i'm doing all your paper yeah but he's not getting any credit for it he's not rising in the world right he's not gonna get a higher station or more money or anything he's doing it behind the scenes so that's one person who else does, we just said, who else does Sidney Carton get compared to? Charles Darnay. Charles Darnay. They happen to look alike. And I made all my little notes, but I don't want to go over them in the same order. Um, after the trial is over, um, oh, and do you remember he took him out? Sidney Carton took Charles Darnay out to, to dinner and he drank, he didn't eat anything, he just drank. Like yeah, he's like, I don't really like you. And, and he... He left, the guy left, and Carton was alone. Do you particularly like the man, he muttered, at his own image? Why should you particularly like a man who resembles you? There's nothing in you to like. You know that. Oh, confound you. What a change you've made in yourself. A good reason for taking to a man, that he shows you what you have fallen away from and what you might have been. Change places with him, and would you have been looked at by those blue eyes as he was? and commiserated by that agitated face as he was. Come on, have it out in plain words. You hate the fellow. He's your twin, but it's like he's your good twin and you're the evil twin. They must be giants have a song called oh. My Evil Twin. Oh, okay. Well, Carton is the evil twin. So we get, we get this we, England, France, Paris, London. Striver, Carton. Charles Darnay, Carton. Um, people compare. Okay, so, Jerry Cruncher. Now let's go back to Jerry Cruncher. Yes, and his spiky hair. And his very interesting job that gives rust. How do you get rust on your fingers? Fishing. Uh, where does he get rust? How do you get any rust on his that. fingers delivering messages? Where does he get rust? Now I get that. Now, now I get it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he goes out with clean boots and he comes back with muddy boots. Because mm -hmm. that's what he does. Apparently, in England, um, it was uh, executed um, criminals could automatic automatically often got their bodies given to science. Mm -hmm. You didn't have a choice. Um, but maybe sometimes they weren't the best bodies. Maybe there was more demand for bodies than they had. I did um, not like that job. So one day, uh, well, I'm getting, I'm 
actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go in order. Let's go in order. Uh, so is there anybody to compare Jerry? Does Jerry have a counterpart? Or a somebody like... Well, I haven't read all of them yet. That's okay. I was behind like eight chapters. Oh, that's okay. Mind, that's okay. Why. You know what? We will... Okay, so we've read half of it right now. So we'll read the next fourth, and you'll be finishing it over Thanksgiving. So actually, okay. if you're a little behind, although I'm, there might be a spoiler, like, in discussion. That's okay. But you will have two weeks to finish. So if, if you're a little behind, don't. You'll be fine. I'm ahead. It was too good. Yay! I would have been ahead if someone grandma handed you Can you tell me, raise your hand if you've read this book before. I have students on Wednesday that have read it before. I'm like, don't tell anything that's going to happen. Um, okay, so yes. So we get the first hint to Jerry Cruncher. You know, at the very beginning, um, he has to ride out. And, of course, they're really scared um, of highwaymen, thieves. And they hear the horse coming. Like, oh, you know, is Mr. Lorry there? And he gives him a message. And the answer to the message, what's the answer to the message? He gives him three oh, words. Lord. Recalled to life. Recalled to life. And Jerry, this is right in chapter two. Um, uh, recalled to life? That's a blazing strange message. Much of that wouldn't do for you, Jerry. I say, Jerry, you'd be in a blazing bad way if recalling to life was to come into fashion, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> That's our first hint. He doesn't want anyone recalled to life. <laughs> because he makes his living digging up dead bodies, um, which we find out later. Which also is a uh, So, interestingly, uh, Thomas, you brought up uh, the mob being compared to a sea, the sea that's rising when the, when the, the, the mob in Paris. Um, but we see, the, we see the sea earlier than that. Um, Mr. Lorry travels to France. We find out that Mr. Lorry has had a relationship with a man named Dr. Manette because he used to manage his estates. And what relation does he have to Lucy Manette? Her dad was presumed dead. Her mother died. And he brought her and put her with wards, with, with caretakers. So when she was a little baby or toddler or whatever, she rode with Mr. Laurie across the English I Channel. Like Mr. Laurie. Mr. Laurie He's sweet. So it says, um, when uh, Mr. Laurie was waiting there um, uh, at Dover, um, if, if he's already crossed or he's waiting to cross. Mr. Lorry had finished his breakfast. He went out for a stroll on the beach. Oh, he's at Dover. The little narrow crooked town of Dover hid itself away from the beach and ran its head into the chalk cliffs like a marine ostrich. The beach was a desert of heaps of sea and stones tumbling wildly about, and the sea did what it liked, and what it liked was destruction. The sea does what it likes, and what it likes is destruction. If people get called the sea in this book, the sea does what it likes. What likes this destruction? So we find out, is her dad dead? Uh -uh. No. Where has he been all this time? In prison. He's been in prison for 18 years. Yikes. And what's their, what's their greatest fear? Lori and Lucy, what's their greatest fear as they go to see him, do you think? Mr. Lori has this little conversation with himself in his mind, and he has this, do you care to be recalled to life. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. And, and the answer was, I can't say. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm confused. I don't, I don't know how to answer these questions. What is his mental state? Not very good. Yeah. He's completely lost it. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't know who he is. He knows his room. And he makes shoes <gasps> to pass the time. And, uh, but time passes. Lucy, being the good-hearted daughter that she is, takes him in along with Miss Pross. Miss Pross, her very vehement 
uh, protectress, who's no nonsense English lady, and up one side, down the other. And exaggerates. Exa does exaggerate. Hundreds of people. Hundreds of people come. Three people come. <laughs> hundreds of people. They all want my Lucy. My ladybird. Yes, mm -hmm. my ladybird. Yeah, um, lady now, notice, I love the fact that, that Dickens does this. Um, I actually had one student on Wednesday, and her mom said, so is this just a series of short stories about people, or is it like, no, it's a novel? Because it goes, it bounces back and forth. Um, we leave them, and they've, they've, they've taken up um, a home in England. By the way, L Lori and Defarge have something in common. They're also a matched pair. What do Lori and Monsieur Defarge have in common? They have a person in common. They both work for Dr. Manette. Defarge was his old servant. Lori is his banker. See, we keep having, keep on the watch. There's just all these pairs of people. It's awesome. Um, so then, yes, the wine. We talked about the wine. Uh, the wine was red wine and had stained the ground of the narrow street in the suburb of St. Antoine in Paris where it was spilled. It stained many hands, too, and many faces and many naked feet and many wooden shoes. I will not read the entire paragraph, but um, the time was to come when that wine, too, would be spilled, that wine, blood, would be spilled on the street stones, and when the stain of it would be read upon many there. I just love that. I love how he ties that in and compares it so cool, I guess. So what are um, the Defarges, what do the Defarges seem to be doing? What, I mean, they run a wine shop, but that's not their main business. That's how they make their living. But what is, what is their mission? Okay. Did every does everyone understand why Madame Defarge is knitting all the time? What is she knitting? I mean, Tina just said it, but what is she knitting? Names. She's knitting names into the register of people doomed to die when the time comes. I don't know if it's actual, I, I get that it's in some sort of code, but people come in and she looks at them, she's knitting, she's always knitting, she's always looking, and she's always knitting because she's keeping the register of the people who are gonna die when the whole revolution breaks out. They're recruiting, right? All the Jacques. Do you remember the 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 Minder of Rhodes? Mm -hmm. And they bring him to Paris and they talk to him because he well, actually, well, let's we're getting ahead in their story. Well, no, we already the went there. Rhodes. The Minder of Rhodes witnessed the guy come to murder the Marquis. And what do they do to the, what, they, they take him out somewhere. Where do they take the Mender of Roads, the Defarges? Um, to, like, to, see the to see the nobility and the royalty. Why? So then he forgets all about um, their interest in the talk. Well, no. Yeah, because he's like, well, why did you show it to them? Because it's like, I don't know. Because they want him to like be on their side. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, I gotta find it. Okay, so we're halfway through. It's before that. Okay, I oh, what? Um, okay, they take him during the whole of this scene. While it last, which lasted some three hours, he had plenty of shouting and weeping and sentimental company because he's yelling, long live the king, long live the queen. Bravo, said Defarge, clapping him on the back when it was over like a patron. You're a good boy. 
The mender of roads was now coming to himself and was mistrustful of having made a mistake in his late demonstrations, but no. You are the fellow we want, said Defarge in his ear. You make these fools believe that it will last forever. Then they are the more insolent, and it is the nearer ended. Hey, cried the mender of roads reflectively, that's true. These fools know nothing. While they despise your breath and would stop it forever and ever, in you or in a hundred like you, rather than in one of their own horses or dogs, they only know what your breath tells them. Let it deceive them, then a little longer. It cannot deceive them too much. Um, as to you, said Madame Defarge, you would shout and shed tears for anything if it made a show and a noise. Say, would you not? Truly, madam, I think so, for the moment. If you were shown a great heap of dolls and were set upon to pluck them to pieces and to spoil them for your own advantage, you would pick out the richest and gayest. Say, would you not? Truly, yes, madame. Yes, and if you were shown a flock of birds unable to fly and were set upon them to strip them of their feathers for, their own, for your own advantage, you would set upon the birds of the finest feathers, would you not? It is true, madame. You have seen both dolls and birds today, said Madame Defarge, with a wave of her hand towards the place where they had last been apparent. Now go home. This is the enemy. We show you the enemy because we want you to attack the enemy. He's obviously not super bright. He's just rolling with it. He's going to do whatever they tell him. The Defarges, on the other hand, know exactly what they're doing, and they're quite intelligent. And so why are they exhibiting Dr. Manette to people? You know, when he's staying above the wine shop before they take him to England? What's the purpose of showing him? He says, I show him to a select few. You're going to show them what the um, nobility's done. Yeah. This is Look what, what they done. did to this man. They, did, they took him yes. from his, his station as a doctor and they made him this. And they made him this, exactly. So they can work up... Um, the frenzy and when the frenzy hits that you know that point where it tips it's going to break out at one point we see the defarge is having a conversation about um M mr defarge thinks it's taking too long mm -hmm. like he's worried i'm not going to be able to see it he's like oh it will come whether we live to see it or not we will have we will have brought it she is so patient <clears throat> scary patient Um, okay, so, <laughs> I'm skipping around a little bit, but the, the scene in the, um, the, the trial, this is very telling. Um, the accused, Charles Darnay, <clears throat> who was, and who knew he was, being mentally hanged, beheaded, quartered by everybody there, um, neither flinched from the situation nor assumed any theatrical air in it. So what's the, what's the, uh, what's the, uh, punishment going to be if he's found guilty? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember this? Hanged, drawn, and quartered. Yes. Yes, yeah. cut, hanged till he's almost dead and then cut down and have his insides yanked out while he's still looking and have him burned before his face and then beheaded. I don't think he'd be alive to get me. Yay! Just... And, uh, it's, where is my, oh, yeah, the sort of interest with which this man was stared and breathed at was not a sort that elevated humanity. Had he stood in peril, peril of a less horrible sentence, had there been a chance of any one of its savage details being spared, by just so much would he have lost in his fascination. The form that was to be doomed to be so shamefully mangled was the sight. The immortal creature that was to be butchered and torn asunder yielded the sensation. Whatever gloss the various spectators put upon the interest, according to their several arts and powers of self-deceit, the interest was, at the root of it, ogreish. The English in this scene are a bunch of ogres, wanting to see the man, because, of course, they he's going to be found guilty, right? Um... They, they know he's going to be uh, found guilty. Here, at the very last paragraph of that, the judge, whose eyes had gone in the general direction, recalled them, 
leaned back in his seat and looked steadily at the man whose life was in his hand as mr attorney general rose to spin the rope grind the axe and hammer the nails into the scaffold it's a done deal okay keep this trial in mind you're going to see a french trial i'd like to compare those two things all right keep that one in mind but remember the interest of the spectators they want to see the guy who's going to be hanged drawn and quartered that's what they want to see they want to stop by the car accident and see the mangled you know car because it's fascinating A metaphor they did not have mangled cars um, they want to stop by the dead baby that the marquee ran over yes no they don't um so back to sydney carton is sydney carton good or bad what's what's wrong with sydney carton he's kind of neutral i mean i don't do you think? <laughs> but but doesn't he's like so sure yes, yeah. he's like, yeah. he's No, are we are we talking so about Sydney Carton or Striver? Oh, We're talking oh, about yeah. yeah, Striver, I definitely agree with you. That he thinks he can ask Lucy to marry him and she's like, Of course, look at me. Look at me. I've got a good job. I've got a nice house. What woman wouldn't want me? And Mr. Lloyd's like yeah, I don't know. Carton's but Sydney Carton. Like what? Um, Carton's the one who tells uh, Lucy yes. all. Yeah, yes. Yes. I know. I so so what? What does he do? Because okay, so let me read this paragraph first. You know, he he um. This is after he has dinner with um. Uh, Darnay, and then he goes and he works all night at Strivers. It's the middle. You know, it's like four in the morning. And then they, they toast the, to Lucy. All right. They don't really know her yet. Um, but Carton calls her a golden haired doll. All right. But notice this golden haired doll that he doesn't like, he doesn't care about. When she starts to pass out at the trial, who notices? Yeah. Sydney Carton. Help her, help her. He wants to get her a message that Charles Darnay has been acquitted because he knows it means something to her. He goes home, and this is how it describes him. Waste forces within him, and a desert all around. This man stood still on his way across the silent terrace, and saw for a moment, lying in the wilderness before him, a mirage of honorable ambition, self-denial, and perseverance. In the fair city of this vision, there were airy galleries from which the loves and graces looked upon him, gardens in which the fruits of life hung ripening, waters of hope that sparkled in his sight. A moment, and it was gone. Climbing to a high chamber in a well of houses, he threw himself down in his clothes on a neglected bed, and its pillow was wet with wasted tears. Sadly, sadly, the sun rose. It rose upon no sadder sight, than the man of good abilities and good emotions, incapable of their directed exercise, incapable of his own help and his own happiness, sensible of the blight on him, and resigning himself to let it eat him away. What is his problem at heart? What is the root of why he is the way he is, do you think? A little bit of self-pity, but I mean, it sounds like it's almost, well, I would say legitimate self-pity, but he is alone and he is a nobody and he does have talent. He has made Striver's career. He just doesn't want to do anything about his situation. I think if he really thought about it and worked for it, he could get his own law practice and start anew and make an actual name for himself, but he just doesn't want to go to the effort to fix his his place in life. Maybe he just doesn't have hope. 
may, maybe all of the above. Yeah. I mean, I want to say laziness, but I mean, there's laziness and then there's that sort of paralyzing fear. I mean, have you ever really wanted to do something, but you were afraid to try because you were afraid you were going to fail? Probably most of us have something like that. It's not the same thing, but some of us it's harder to overcome than others if you tend towards being wanting it be perfect. You don't really want to try because you know you're going to botch it. Um, and then some people seem to be a little more okay with that. You know, like, oh, I'll give it a shot and I'll do my best and we'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to say. Does he, is he just like, he doesn't see, he just stayed up till four in the morning doing Striver's work. It doesn't seem lazy. So, like, what is it inside him that keeps him, like, I can't ever be better than I am. Is it fear of failure? Is it, Charles Dickens doesn't tell us. We just have to kind of get to know Sidney Carton and make up our minds. But anyway, keep, as you read, just keep kind of thinking, what, what is it? Because I'm not sure I know the answer. Like, people actually write essays on Tale of Two Cities, like, what's up with Sidney Carton? Because he says he's such a miserable, because he goes to Lucy and he says that he loves her. And he says uh, that he would, um, that's not one that I marked. Um, I will do anything, okay, I actually have to find it now. Oh, okay. He says, I can't ever be better. She says, can't I make you better? No. No, but I just want you to know that the very last time I opened my heart to anyone, it was you. And then he says, um, the time will come, the time will not be long in coming when new ties will be formed about you, ties that will bind you yet more tenderly and strongly to the home you so adorn, the dearest ties that will ever grace and gladden you. Oh, Miss Manette, when the little picture of a happy father's face looks up in yours, when you see your own bright beauty springing up anew at your feet, think now and then that there is a man who would give his life to keep a life you love beside you. He said farewell, and a last God bless you, and left her. Stri okay, so now we have a Striver versus Carton as a, as a suitor. <laughs> Striver. <clears throat> She's lucky oh to yeah, have the last whoa, oh, yeah, she's the luckiest girl in the world. Just say yes like that. And of course, when Lori says, eh, think about it. by the time he meets up with him later, he's like, yeah, I thought about that. I, that's, I'm glad you warned me. She's not the type. She, you know, she's too flighty. She's too, and he glosses it over. The, Carton, the though, should be too sour. It's yeah, like the, the sour grapes thing. Yes, Carton really feels it but won't do it. Won't do it because Striver's like, I'm so good for her, and Carton's like, I'm so beneath you. I'm so beneath you. I'm so irritated that it's almost 12.45. Um, so then we, let me see if there's anything else I want to talk about in, oh. So uh, towards the end of what I had you read, um, finally, Charles Darnay, we saw it coming a mile off. I Sydney saw Carton it saw it coming. Charles Darnay wants to marry Lucy. But I saw problem. It from yeah. the first book. Yes. Problem what to do with dad. Dad is emotionally um, teetering. Uh, teetering. Okay? And he needs care. Like, we need to be careful with him. Um, and so. Um, the, the doc, he's talking to the doctor and we get this odd scene okay the young man had taken his hand gratefully um, and, and do, the doctor Manette was saying this if there were Charles Darnay if there were any fancies any reasons any apprehensions anything whatsoever new or old against the man she really loved the direct responsibility thereof not lying on his head they should all be obliterated for her sake. So strange was the way in which he faded into silence, and so strange his fixed look when he ceased to speak. 
that Darnay felt his own hand turn cold in the hand that slowly released and dropped it. Something has happened. He's just said, Mr. Darnay, even if I suspected there was some reason, not through any fault of his, of course, but some re something I might have against the man she loved, I I'd let it go. Why would he say? What? He's staring hard at Charles Darnay. Even if I might suspect something about the man she really loved, even if I thought there was something questionable, uh, what is he hinting? What? I mean, I'm not asking for a specific, but does Dr. Manette have something against Charles Darnay? Swear to me, they, they only met on that boat coming over. And he glazes over. And then do you remember the morning of the wedding? Mm -hmm. Charles Darnay said, I will tell you who I am. I will tell you my real name the morning of the wedding. And they came out of the room. Okay, let me find it. The door of the doctor's room opened and out he came out with Charles Darnay. He was so deadly pale, which had not been the case when they went in together, that no vestige of color was to be seen in his face. But in the composure of his manner, he was unaltered, except that to the shrewd glance of Mr. Lorry, it disclosed some shadowy indication that the old air of avoidance and dread had lately passed over him like a cold wind. And when you stopped reading, what has happened? Charles and Lucy have gone on honeymoon. Dr. Manette is He's oblivious making manager. shoes. And he doesn't know anyone. Sorry, Thomas. So sad. <laughs> okay, like now. He heard something. He heard something that brought it all back. That it made him remember. Yes. His 18 years in prison. Is this like the box that they found in front of his like dick? And it's a dick and he like yeah, got I... silent after they said that and they're like, you couldn't tell what, was, what it said. Yes. Remember that. Just remember it. The story about the prisoner who buried something. A note. Oh, okay. So and it made him... Okay, so before I let you go, though, we have to visit the Marquis. All right, the guy's a rotter. Obviously, he ran down a child. He, he doesn't care. He throws some money. He had it coming, but he I did. don't condone what they did. And the poor lady wanted to gravestone me. Now, that. who is the Marquis' nephew? Charles. Charles Darnay. Uh, is French nobility. Is rotten French nobility, as a matter <laughs> of fact. His uncle is a crud, and we assume that his dead father was too. You know, the Marquis's deceased brother, Charles's father. Twins? Yeah, twins. And, uh, and what has Charles been going back and forth to France doing? You know, he was on trial for treason. They thought he was going back and forth trying to raise support for the American rebellion in France and do nefarious things against England. What has he actually been going back and forth doing, do you think? Is he renouncing... The name. He's renouncing that he's 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 disposing of all his estates and renouncing the name. He's like closing down all of his French life and his accounts. He's like, I don't want any of this. I don't want your house. I don't want your money. I don't want you. I don't want you. I I'm not one of you. I don't want anything to do with you, um, because you all are absolutely rotten. Um, So his beautiful stone chateau, uh, Charles Darnay says, I abandon it. Ha, said the Marquis, glancing round the luxurious room. Charles goes on, to the eye, it is fair enough here, but seen in its integrity under the sky and by the daylight, it is a crumbling tower of waste, mismanagement, extortion, debt, mortgage, oppression, hunger, nakedness, and suffering. 
Because the people in the village are treated horribly. Remember, where is all their money going? To him. To the marquee. They're paying taxes. Remember that where they're paying X percent of everything to the, to the local noble. They can barely live. He doesn't, that poor lady is begging for a tombstone to mark her husband's grave who's starved to death, died of overwork, and they can't even do that. And so, yes, uh, but a shadow uh, is lurking and uh, we have uh, stone faces like gargoyles. And in the morning, um, there's one more stone face, it says. I'm trying to find the beautiful, oh yes. They're ringing bells. There's an alarm sent up. It portended that there was one stone face too many up at the chateau. The Gorgon had surveyed the building again in the night and had added the one stone face wanting, the stone face for which it had waited through about 200 years. It lay back on the pillow of Monsieur the Marquis. It was like a fine mask, suddenly startled, made angry and petrified. Driven home into the heart of the stone figure attached to it was a knife. Round its hilt was a frill of paper on which was scrawled, drive him fast to his tomb. This from Jacques. Who threw the coin? Oh, I don't know if it was Defarge or, Defarge or the dad. It's hard to say. I think it was Defarge too, but we don't know. That just we don't seems know. like something Defarge would do. I left out, I left out one important plot point. Um, there were two uh, witnesses at Charles Darnay's trial, um, John Barsad and Roger Cly. And later on, we found out that um, John Barsad died. Apparently, nobody was very happy about that. They were harassing the funeral. Do you remember this part where they're harassing the funeral? And uh, But that's the night that Jerry Cruncher Jr., <laughs> His name is Jerry Crunch Jr. Followed his dad Jackson. fishing. And things didn't go well. Do we know why they didn't go well? He came back in a very bad mood and his wife must have been flopping. <laughs> flopping against his, you know, his work. Because she wants him to be converted and uh, not Rob Graves anymore. Do we know? Do we have any suspicion why he came back in such a bad mood that night? Because he was going to go rob John Barsad's grave. Since I wrote ahead, I think I know what... Okay, to keep it to yourself if you're in Is it because there were so many people around that he couldn't get... Well, no, because the people he was with were his, his grave robbing buddies. A surgeon that was going to take the body, you know, the people he worked with, you know, the people that he joined. And... Oh, my God. <laughs> we shall see. But whatever he expected to find, he didn't find. There's no body in the grave. Just keep that in mind. It was a very unsatisfying grave robbery for Someone, the body of John Barsad. Someone else already robbed a grave. We shall see. Okay, so here's what I have for you. I have more documents of the French Revolution, because I'm sure you just like go home and just pour over them. Um, this one is sort of a day-by-day uh, the, the week that the Bastille was stormed, it was July 14th is, is the day, but it's a, um, uh, a journal, and it's actually Thomas Jefferson's, he was the diplomat to France when it happened. It's wow. Thomas Jefferson's account. Also, we have a little cartoon at the bottom, and it's actually, all right, I think I have one extra here, so let me keep one. And I'll tell you, I, I didn't print in color. Our printer doesn't really do color very well. You can find this online, too. But look at the second page when you get it, and look at the little picture. And it's, so it's, at the bottom, there's a poor man crawling on his hands and knees. He's like skin and bones. Can you see that there's a guy mm -hmm. crawling? His eyes are bandaged, and he, like, has chains on his ankles and his wrists and everything. And basically, the people riding him are the three estates. We have the clergyman, the king and the nobility, and the, like, the merchant classes. They're all riding on the poor serf, 
the poor peasant. This is a cartoon. It's not a ha-ha funny cartoon. You know, it's like a political cartoon. And here's what I would like you guys to do. Yes, you are going to write something for me, but no, you're not going to write something very long. You're just going to have fun. You're just going to have fun this week. It is going to be fun. You have a look like, oh, it's not going to be fun. Okay, so. Hey. Okay, so last year or the year before, I don't know, sometime in the last couple of years, maybe both years, for those of you who've done high school for the last two years, we talked about antithesis, okay? We've talked about parallelism. We've tried parallelism in our brains. We talked about antithesis, which was, here, go ahead and, and take these and pass them around. Let me have one. I kept, I have one for Catherine, so I know I have an extra one. Here you go, Adriana. And antithesis is um, a statement or a comment where you have opposites. And the perfect, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of, you know, that whole entire first paragraph of A Tale of Two Cities is antithesis. It's the so best. I gave you some examples here. Um, I can't find an author at all for that last one. I looked and nobody can decide who's the author of that last one. As you can see, I just copied and pasted. Yeah, that when there is need of silence, you speak. Sometimes people said it was Lincoln and then somebody said it was Theodore Roosevelt. Sounds Roman to me. Mm -hmm. Like some Roman guy would say this. Anyway, so here are examples. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Um, this was Satan speaking in a Paradise okay, Lost, which good. is the, the character was Satan, yes. To err is human, to forgive divine. Give me liberty or give me death. Um, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Okay. I, the one I always, the example I always gave you was, I drink lemonade in the summer when it's hot, but I enjoy cocoa in the winter when it's cold. Okay, this is antithesis. What I'd like you to do, you can do it on this paper, you can do it on a separate paper. I'd like you to come up with five sentences of antithesis about anything seriously about anything you want you can make them long like the paragraph you can make them long like dickens first paragraph uh, of tale of two cities you could just be short like pope or you know i don't care come up with five sentences that create an antithesis and this whole time that we're talking about tale of two cities i'd like to just talk about the concept of antithesis because you know we have carton versus darnay we've got uh, the French versus the English. We've, we've got all these antitheses of one character versus his counterpart. And so I just like to kind of follow this all the way through as we read the book. But just, that's all I want you to do. Let me read this week. Oh, please read. Do you just finish book the second? Um, finish book the second and read book the third, chapters one through seven. So up through chapter seven of book the third. That should be another fourth, of, or yeah, another fourth, and then the final fourth will do. Book three what? One through seven. Okay, and thank you. Okay, goodbye, Catherine and Marta and Raymond. See you next week, hopefully. Bye bye.